your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. We have covered the eight main types of Bible covenants, and then we covered the shoe covenant, and then last week we covered the threshold covenant, and tonight I want us to learn about another one of the least known covenants that's in the Bible, and that's the salt covenant. The salt covenant. We've learned from this series that God is a God of covenant. The word says in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy. That word mercy in the Hebrew is hesed. He keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God is a covenant keeping God and he expects us, his people, to be a covenant keeping people. Just as God is faithful to keep his covenant, his hesed, his mercy, that he shows to those that love him. This is exactly what the salt covenant is about. The salt covenant is a covenant of faithfulness. The salt covenant is a covenant of loyalty. The salt covenant is a covenant of friendship. Not just regular friendship, but it's a covenant of strong friendship. Salt was used in Bible days to seal a bond of friendship for Ever. The salt covenant is an unbreakable covenant. In the East, in Bible days, salt was considered to represent blood or life. The people in the East considered salt to be just as important as your life blood. Did you know you cannot exist, you cannot live without salt? There are Three fluids in the human body that is very, very salty. Do you know what they are? I bet if I start the list, you can finish it. Blood, sweat, tears. That's exactly right. All of those three Bible, those fluids in our bodies are very salty. And salt in the Bible is very, very significant. And people in the East considered it as important as blood and life itself. The salt covenant is another form of the blood covenant. The blood covenant, the threshold covenant, and the salt covenant are all different forms of the same covenant. The blood covenant, threshold covenant, and salt covenant are all forms of the same covenant. They're all linked. And I've only heard in all of the years that I have heard teaching and preaching, I've only heard two teachings on the Salt Covenant. One was about 25 years ago. I had the opportunity of being in a meeting with a man who, had, who has an earned doctorate. He teaches at Bible colleges. And he taught on the Salt Covenant. And at the end of the service, we had a Salt Covenant ceremony. And it was at my sister's church years ago. And my sister and I was talking about it the other day, and she said, you know, I still remember that night, and I said, I do too. It was one of the most life-changing nights I've ever experienced at church. And I will never forget it as long as I live. And I pray that this night, it'll be the same for you, I pray. If you'll receive it, this night will be a life-changing experience. You'll never forget this night. If you'll receive it from the word and apply it this night. In Leonardo da Vinci's painting on, on the, of the Last Supper. How many of you have seen a picture of that painting? On the table in front of Judas Iscariot is a salt cellar. They called it back then. We call it a salt shaker. And the salt cellar or salt shaker in this painting is turned over on its side and salt is spilling out on the table. Did you notice that when you looked at that picture? It's a perfect symbol of a broken covenant. The eastern expression to betray the salt meant to betray one's master. 
And that's exactly what Judas Iscariot did to Jesus. He betrayed his master. Now, why did da Vinci paint this? It was to show us that Judas was eating a covenant meal with the Lord Jesus, yet he was a traitor. And he got up from that covenant meal and he betrayed the Lord. And I believe with all my heart that the reason Judas committed suicide, he went out and hung himself, was because he was so tormented by the fact that he had betrayed his covenant brother. I believe that he was so tormented mentally over that that he couldn't take it anymore, and that's why he committed suicide. Why? Because there was salt between them. And as we study this tonight, you'll see the significance. In the East, the term traitor means untrue to salt. The Eastern term for traitor means untrue to salt or one faithless to salt. They also call a traitor abusers of the salt because they're not faithful to the covenant of brotherhood. To this day in the East, they still use the phrase, there is salt between us. And they also say, he has eaten of my salt. Salt in the East symbolized hospitality. When men in the East ate a meal together with salt, they became covenant friends for life. Since salt is a preservative, it's symbolic of an everlasting, enduring covenant. And I read in study about the salt covenant that the Arabic word for salt and compact and treaty is the same word in the Arabic language. The word salt, compact, and treaty is all the same word in that language. In the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5, and if you mark in your Bibles, you need to mark this verse. 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5, Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? Had you ever read that before? A covenant of salt? We studied the Davidic covenant in detail, so I'm not going to spend time on it here. I only want to point out that God gave the kingdom of Israel and the kingship to David and to David's seed forever. And how did God do it? By a covenant of salt. God gave the kingdom to David. He set David in as king and David's seed after him. And God promised David that, that his seed would always reign and rule on the throne. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is a descendant from King David. And God gave the kingdom and established David in it by a covenant of salt. The Davidic covenant is a bonded salt covenant between God and David and David's seed, his sons and his offspring, his descendants. And we are the spiritual seed of Abraham and we're also the spiritual seed of David. Therefore, we are heirs to this eternal friendship covenant of and by salt. Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. And since Jesus came from David's loins, or his descendants, Jesus' lineage and his throne are both established by this covenant of salt. Because we just read in 2 Chronicles 13, 5, that God gave the kingdom over Israel to David and his sons forever. And Jesus is in that lineage. And he gave it to David by a covenant of salt. Jesus' blood along with his friendship covenant of salt. Guarantees our eternal security as his bride. Hallelujah. Salt covenants and ordinances cannot be altered. They cannot be changed. They cannot be done away with. They cannot be repealed. They cannot be broken. They are for 
ever. I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18. And I want you to mark this. If you mark in your Bibles. And if you don't mark in that Bible. Then get you one that you can mark in. Numbers chapter 18 verse 19. Numbers 18, 19. This is one of our key passages, and I want you to turn to it and read it out of your Bible. Numbers 18, 19. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee, and thy sons and thy daughters with thee by statute. How long? Forever. It is a covenant of salt. Forever before the Lord unto thee and unto thy seed with thee. The Hebrew roots says that the covenant of salt indicates the everlasting nature of the relationship between Israel and the children of salt. The children of Israel is called the children of salt. Why? Because they're in a salt covenant with Jehovah God. All salt covenants are eternal. They're enduring. They're never changing. They are abiding forever. God himself said it here in Numbers 18. Let's read it one more time. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee by statute. How long? Forever. Ever. It is a covenant of salt. How long? Forever. Between the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. And we are the spiritual seed of Israel. Therefore, we are the spiritual seed of the children of the salt. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. Go back one book. Leviticus chapter 2. Verse 13. Leviticus 2, 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from any meat offering or meal offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. What did God say? He said, don't leave the salt out. You, on every offering, every type of offering, you have to put salt on it. And in notice, he says, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant. Do you see it? Salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from any meat offering or meal offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. If salt was left out of an offering, then it was considered as an unacceptable offering to the Lord. Every offering that you presented to the Lord had to have salt. And because of that, great quantities of salt were required in the temple service and in the tabernacle. I want you to jot these scriptures down. Ezekiel chapter 43 verses 23 through 24. You can re look them up and read them later. Ezekiel 43, 23 and 24. Ezra chapter 6 verse 9. Ezra chapter 6 verse 9. These two scriptures refer to salt. And then Ezra chapter 7 verses 22 and 23 is, is talking about what to bring. And it says silver, wheat, wine, oil. God's giving them a list of things. And he says, and salt without prescribing how much. In other words, salt without limit. Don't put a limit on the salt that you bring. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. What did God require every offering? To have salt. And why did he require every offering to have salt? Well, the Jewish encyclopedia says that the offering that you brought to the temple or to the tabernacle and offered, and the priest offered it up to the Lord. The Jewish encyclopedia says this offering was the meal of God. When you brought an offering of a lamb, when you brought a meal offering, 
any offering you brought to the Lord and the priest offered it up to the Lord, that was considered the meal of God. You was bringing a meal and serving God himself. In Bible days, when two people entered into a blood covenant, they sealed the covenant with a covenant meal. And we're going to start the blood covenant next week, and I can't wait. We'll get into this in detail when we cover the blood covenant. The salt was a symbol of the eternal duration of a covenant. A covenant that would last forever. Salt is referred to in the Bible as symbolizing the covenant between God and Israel. The children of Israel. The children of the salt. In Leviticus 2.13 that we read. God said every offering was to have salt. That meant every meal offering, every grain offering, every burnt offering of animals. The priest was required to salt, the, salt that offering down before he offered it up to the Lord. When the people brought an offering with salt and the priest offered it up to God, it was as if God himself ate that meal. And depending on the type of offering... That you brought. There were five main types of offerings. That people brought. In the, in the Old Testament. And we don't have time to cover them. Because that's a whole teaching in itself. But depending on which type. Of offering that you brought. The priest also. Ate part of that offering. Also very often. The person that brought the offering. Ate part of that Offering too. So it was as if you and God. Sat down together. And had a meal together. Oh. How awesome. It was as if God. And the person that brought that offering. Was sharing a covenant meal. The bread. On the table of shoe bread. Was made with salt. Did you realize that? God instructed the priest to put 12 loaves of bread, representing one loaf for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They, and they were to bake it fresh, put it on the table of shoe bread, and it was to stay there for a week. And then they, the priest would eat that bread. And do you know what I read in studying? I read that the bread was still warm, and it was not stale. After sitting out in the open. Can you imagine if you left a piece of bread. Laying out on your counter. For a whole week. But the priest ate it. At the end of each week. When they would bake new, new bread. And so I have read in studying. That the bread on the table of shoe bread. Stayed warm. And fresh. Just as if it had been freshly taken out of the oven. Every Week, And it was prepared with salt. In Leviticus chapter 24 verses 8 through 9. It says every Sabbath Aaron was to set the bread before the Lord continually. Being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons. And they shall eat it in the holy place. For it is most holy unto him an everlasting covenant God said every Sabbath Aaron the high priest was to set the bread on the on the table of shoe bread before the Lord continually and it was to be an everlasting covenant and Aaron and his sons who were the priests they ate that bread in the holy place for it was most holy unto the Lord. The priest and God ate a meal together of bread and salt every week. The Jewish encyclopedia says after the destruction of the temple and the people could no longer bring their offerings to the temple and the priest could no longer minister in the temple after that temple was destroyed, the Jewish encyclopedia says that the table that you set in your home, when you set that table for a meal that was considered your altar. From the point that the, the temple was destroyed. From that time forward. Your table in your home 
that was your altar. And the rabbis say that salt should be put on the table and that blessing should not be recited without salt on that table. The strict Jews to this day enter into a covenant of salt at their family table every time they sit down to a meal. The head of the house in the Jewish home speaks the blessing over the bread. That's the first thing that they do when they sit down to a meal in a Jewish home. The blessing over the bread is, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who causes bread to grow out of the earth. And then the Jewish father takes that loaf of bread and he breaks it in as many pieces as there are persons present. If there are five people at the table, the Jewish father breaks that loaf of bread into five pieces. And then he dips each piece in salt. And then he hands each piece to each member of that household sitting at that table. And then every one of them eat that bread together. They are entering into a salt covenant every time. Why? Because the table is now their altar. In Exodus chapter 30, verses 34 and 35, this passage describes the ingredients of the holy anointing oil. And they were to be mixed. These ingredients of the holy anointing oil was to be mixed and tempered together. This word in the Hebrew, this word tempered means salted. So salt was even used in the holy anointing oil in the temple. Jewish Encyclopedia says that eating the salt of a man means to derive one's sustenance from him and to take pay from him or to be hired by him. Ezra chapter 4 verse 14 says, Now therefore we have maintenance from the king's palace, and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore have we sent and certified the king. Now we read this in the King James, and it doesn't make sense to us, but in, to the Hebrew mind, it makes perfect sense. That word maintenance, now because we have maintenance, that word maintenance in the Hebrew is Malach, M-E-L-A-C-H, M-E-L-A-C-H, and it means to eat salt. The literal translation of this verse is, we are salted with the king's salt, or we eat the salt of the king's palace. In other words, they were on king's payroll, and they were being paid by the king. And how was the king paying them? In salt. Salt was considered so valuable in Bible days that it was equal to money. And in many places, salt was used instead of money. In some lands in the east, gold was abundant. But it was not considered as important as salt. Gold itself was con considered to be of less value than salt. In Bible days, soldiers were paid with salt. In New Testament days, in the days of Jesus, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. They didn't get money, they got salt. The Latin word salarium, S-A-L-A-R-I-U-M, means salt money. We get our English word salary from this Latin word salarium. To say that a man is not worth his salt. Have you ever heard that expression? It means that he's not worth the salary he's being paid. Because in Bible days, men were paid by salt instead of money. The Israelites knew that salt was a preservative. They preserved their food with salt. They didn't have electricity. A lot of them still don't. They live in the desert, the tent dwellers. So if they are going to preserve meat, they use salt. And in Bible days, they used salt to remove any blood remaining from the meat because when they killed an animal, God instructed them that they were to drain the blood. And so they would salt that meat down to draw out any blood that was still remaining in that meat. And also use salt for medicinal purposes, medical purposes. Newborn infants in Bible days were rubbed with salt. Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 4. And as for thy nativity in the day that thou was born, thou was 
Thou, though thou wast washed in water, thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. They rubbed salt on a newborn baby for cleansing, for purifying, and to make that baby's skin dense and firm. In other words, to toughen that baby's skin. If you lived out in the desert, a little baby would not survive unless they rubbed it down with salt to make, make its skin tougher in order to be able to, to take the hot desert heat and the winds and the sand that it, it was going to encounter. And I read that the Arabs in the desert consider salt to be so necessary that in the absence of salt, they bathe their infants in camel's urine because there's no water. Aren't you glad we don't live in the desert? And did you know that women wash their hair in camel's urine in the desert? Makes me real glad to live in America, don't it, you? <laughs> They considered salt so valuable. They couldn't live without it. Neither can we, but it's more abundant and more available to us today than it was to them. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, there was a spring of poison water. And the prophet Elisha, verse 21 says, went forth unto the spring of waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. How was these poison waters healed? He threw in salt in that poison water, and the salt healed that water. The Israelites considered salt as a necessary ingredient of food. Salt was used for seasoning. Job asked the question in Job chapter 6 verse 6. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? The Septuagint translation says, can bread be eaten without salt? And the answer in the east would be no. You must have salt. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, verses 49 through 50, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. According to the customs of Bible days, Jesus was saying salt is equivalent or equal to life. He was saying have life in yourselves. Have salt in yourselves. The New Testament here in Mark 9 repeats the command in the Old Testament. Where God gave the children of Israel the commandment that every sacrifice or offering would be offered with salt. Since salt was used for for preserving or purifying, we are to be permeated with the preserving grace of God. We are to have salt in ourselves. We are to be salt shakers and shake out and pour out God's grace to the world. It was God's desire that we be sealed with the eternal salt covenant. And we be seasoned with salt. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. We enter into an everlasting salt covenant. With God himself. We become children of the salt. Just as he called the children of Israel. And we are salted with his everlasting grace. And we're given eternal life. The grace of God purifies us and preserves us for all of eternity. And while we are here on this, this earth, we're to have salt or life in ourselves. And to join together with others who have salt. I read that salt treaties are called oftentimes peace treaties. Peace treaties. Salt treaties. 
is a type or a picture of the church. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Jesus said, We are the salt of the earth. We are to be salt shakers to shake out and pour out his life to the world out there in the dark place. Salt in Bible days was a token or a sign of friendship. In the east, salt was on every table. No Jewish home was without salt. Every year at the Passover meal, the Passover table has a bowl of salt water on it. And items of food are dipped in that bowl of salt water and then eaten. In the east, if a man partakes of the salt of another man, it means that he's entering into a covenant with that man. And when a man is in his tent, if a visitor comes to the host's tent, he's under the protection of that host. Even if a man's worst enemy comes into his tent and eats of his salt, the host is obligated to protect that man and to, pro to provide for him as long as he's in his tent. He is to protect him, to take care of him, just as if he was his closest friend. We saw that last week in the Threshold Covenant with Lot protecting these two strangers that he had never seen before, over and above protecting his own daughters. It's the same principle with the Salt Covenant as it was when we studied last week with the Threshold Covenant. Same principle, same meaning. Remember, we learned last week that when a guest arrived at the tent or the home of someone in the east, that the host, that homeowner, would kill an animal at the door, at the threshold. That he would slit the throat, let the blood drain out in a trench that was dug at the threshold. And after that blood was poured out, then and only then would that guest cross over that threshold. Stepping over the threshold, but never stepping on it. And when he entered into that home, he was entering into a covenant with the host. The host was obligated to protect him. But did you realize that in Bible days, if an animal could not be killed, and his blood could not be shed, and poured out at the threshold... If they couldn't kill an animal and shed blood, they took salt. And they put that salt on that threshold instead of blood. And that guest would step over that threshold of salt. And it had the same meaning and the same significance and the same binding force as if it was blood. Salt and blood to the Man's mind that lives in the east are the same. Salt was recognized to be equivalent to blood. Adam Clark commentary says that salt was used as the emblem of an incorruptible covenant. And those who ate bread and salt together were considered as having entered into a very solemn covenant. One way in which two Bedouin tent dwellers in the east entered into a covenant in Bible days, and many of them still today, they do this. Each of them would put some grains of salt on a piece of bread, and they would put that bread with that salt in each other's mouth and feed that bread to each other and say, by this salt and bread... I will not betray thee. Another way that they entered into a covenant of salt in Bible days was that two men would pour salt in their right hand and then they would throw that salt over their right shoulder and then they would shake hands and grasp each other's hand with that residue of salt still in their hands and they would say, there is salt between us. And that would seal that covenant agreement that they had entered into. 
Back in Bible days, when two men entered into a business agreement, they would sit down and they would go back and forth over the terms of the agreement, deciding what it was that they was going to enter into a covenant. It would kind of be like us making a contract today. And after they would agree on the terms, they would eat salt. And then they would realize that by eating salt, that would bind them together in what they called a salt covenant. This salt covenant established a contract that could not be broken in Bible days. In the East, to swear by the salt was to swear an oath to keep the agreement or the covenant. In Bible days, every man carried a leather pouch that had salt in it. And when two people wanted to enter into a salt covenant, which is a covenant of loyalty, they would each recite the details of the covenant, and then each man would reach into his pouch of salt and take a pinch of salt from his pouch and put it into the other man's pouch. Then they would close their pouches and shake them. And they were saying into the, uh, to the effect that the only way that this contract or covenant between us can possibly be broken is for each one of us to reach into the other one's pouch and to take out our exact grains of salt that we put in. Is it possible to do that? Mm -mm. That's how a salt covenant was made in Bible days. In Bible days, the marriage salt covenant was done the same way. And I want to illustrate this by asking Pastor Mike and Pastor Sue if they'll come to the table and enter into a marriage salt covenant. When a man and a woman in the East are going to enter into a marriage salt covenant, they each bring a leather pouch which has salt in it. And they'll come to the table. And on that table, there's always a cup of wine. Or you can use grape juice if you prefer. And on that table is a loaf of bread. And also on the table is a salt cellar. Or we would say a salt shaker. And what they do, the man and the woman, they each break off a piece of that bread. One loaf of bread. They each break off a piece of that bread. And then they put salt on that bread. They take the piece of bread. They salt that piece of bread. And then they feed that bread to each other. The modern tradition that we have today of the bride and groom feeding each other a bite of wedding cake. Guess where that came from? And then they would partake of the cup of wine. The, Pastor Mike. <laughs> they each partake of that cup of wine. What's this a picture of? Communion. And then they each open up their leather pouch. And they reach inside. And they take a pinch of salt from their pouch. And they put that salt into the other one's pouch. And then they close the pouches and shake those pouches. Now, Pastor Mike, you reach into Pastor Sue's pouch and you take out the exact grains of salt that you put in. And Pastor Sue, you reach into Pastor Mike's pouch and you take the exact grains of salt that you put in his pouch. Can it be done? No way. In the marriage salt covenant, you are binding yourself to the other one. In utmost loyalty and truthfulness and faithfulness. Even to the point of suffering death rather than breaking that covenant. You are showing that your commitment to each other cannot be broken. Unless you can retrieve your own grains of salt from the other one's pouch. Since this is impossible, the marriage salt covenant is a symbol of an unbreakable covenant. And it's a vow of eternal love 
to one another. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It doesn't matter if you think you don't love them anymore. Too bad. You have entered into an everlasting covenant. And it is till death do you part. Those grains of salt, just as they are forever joined in that pouch, you are forever joined as one. Amen? Amen. And now, for anyone who would like to participate, we are going to enter into a salt covenant. A covenant of loyalty. Our brother and our sister in Christ. This is completely optional. Don't feel any obligation to do this. You may want to enter into the salt covenant with one person or two, two people. You may not feel to enter into it at all, and that's fine. It's perfectly fine. Don't feel any pressure or any obligation. Why? Because it, this is a binding agreement forever. And you do not want to make a vow unless you're going to keep it. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. If you want to jot these scriptures down. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Entering into a salt covenant is making a vow. You're swearing an oath. You are swearing that oath. That you will keep that oath with that brother or that sister for life. Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 21. It says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require or demand it of thee. And it would be sin to thee. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. In other words, if you're not going to keep your vow, it's better not to vow. It's better not to enter into that oath if you're not going to keep it. Because God will require it of you. Whew. Very solemn. Very serious. I cannot stress enough the importance of this. Think about it before you enter into it. Can you keep it? Can you keep that covenant of loyalty? Faithfulness. Unity. Oneness. Because the word says, I just read you three scriptures that tells you it's better not to make a vow than to make it and break it. Making a vow is swearing an oath to that person. It's a very serious and solemn thing. You're, covenant, you're covenanting to love, to be loyal to, to stand with, to uphold, to encourage, to help, to pray for, and to protect one another. You're saying, you're my brother, you're my sister in Christ. And we are one in the Spirit from this day forward, if you enter into the salt covenant. And you're saying, to hurt you would be to hurt myself. And I'll never gossip about you. I'll never slander you. I'll never badmouth you to anyone. As long as I live. I'll never criticize you. I'll never hurt you with the words of my mouth. I'll never bring harm to you in any way. To harm you would be to harm myself. Wow. Can you do it? Can you keep that? Don't enter into it if you can't keep it. Don't enter into it lightly. This is one of the most powerful things that you'll ever do this side of eternity. Other than actually getting married to your mate. This is the next most binding agreement that you can ever enter into. So those of you who want to enter into a salt covenant. You can come up. Pastor Sue will pour salt in your right hand hand. You'll cup your hand like that. She'll pour salt into your right hand. 
then you'll close that hand and wait until everybody has salt in their hand and then you'll throw that salt over your right shoulder and there'll be some residue of salt that will stick to your hand and then you'll go to that one that you want to enter into that salt covenant with and you'll take them by the right hand with that residue of salt still in your hand and, and it'll be in their hand and you'll be mixing your salt together and you say there is salt between us and you are entering into a salt covenant just as they did in the east just as they did in bible days there is salt between us and then you'll tell them that you're entering into a covenant with them to be loyal to them to love them to the, to encourage them to honor them to pray for them to stand with them to protect them to help them if the enemy attacks them you're to stand with them, pray with them, encourage them, help them in any way. Be loyal and faithful to them till death do you part. Amen? Amen. Amen.